Rita's going to help me uh, with this poem. Uh, I got a call from uh, Kelsey, what's, what's her last name, Fisher? Fisher. Uh, w I was at the meal for the homeless, the Carpos meal uh, at St. Mary's in Painesville. We were cleaning up and I got this call, can you immediately go down to the Geauga Jail and pick somebody up? And uh, I said, yeah, because that means I didn't have to mop the floor. <laughs> And, uh, but uh, I would have said yes, no matter what. Uh, this w it was a woman who had been held by ICE in the Geauga County Jail, and they were letting her out because they couldn't handle the situation, which the poem will explain a little bit. So uh, this was such an amazing story that I, uh, I put it down in poetry, it's sort of a long <laughs> narrative poem, but uh, I think that you'll find the story interesting. And uh, I've uh, fictionalized the Spanish, the, the names of the, the Mexicans in this poem, but uh, the rest of the th poem is essentially true. It's called uh, Reading Psalm 91 with New Eyes. Salmo 91, leyendo con ojos nuevos. They asked me to pick up a person from the Geauga County Jail. ICE released her, and she needed a motel for the night, and then to fly to her sisters in Chicago in the morning. Por supuesto. Puedo hacerlo. I'd, be, I'd be glad to do it, I said. I hurried to the jail and met a pretty young woman with her lawyer. I'll call her Miguela. Have her get an Uber to the airport tomorrow, her lawyer said, and she hurried off after spending hours at the jail with her. In my car, I, el I asked Miguela if she was hungry, and indeed she was, not having eaten since 11 a.m. ¿Quieres la comida mexicana? I asked, and the answer was quick and enthusiastic. No home cooking in the months she'd been in jail. We walked into El Patron in Chardon, and she immediately knew the server, Catalina, who embraced her. Same thing happened again when Feliciano met her. For the next 20 minutes, as the food was being prepared, she laughed and jabbered in her home tongue, greeted warmly by all the Mexicans working in the restaurant. Then off to my home, where she ate the genuine Mexican food for the first time in ages. As she ate, she spoke with Linda, mi esposa, and I noticed Miguel's stunning appearance, about five foot tall, long black hair, dark eyes, the cheekbones of the ind indigenous. She was dressed very nice and it was obvious these weren't jail clothes. Her attorney went beyond the normal call of duty. After eating, we needed for Miguela to buy her plane ticket. Her sister sent a visa card number and we started to fill out the ticket form online. Linda typed in the info, but first Miguela handed us her pasaporte so we could get everything right. And there I discovered her official name was Miguel, and the M was checked on the passport for masculino. And now I understood why ICE dismissed her from a men's prison. The situation for Miguela must have been difficult and maybe dangerous. In the morning, we drove Miguela to the airport. Neither she nor we knew how to get an Uber, and she had never been on an airplane before. I wanted to tell her about getting through the security check. At the airport, <clears throat> before she disappeared into the TSA area, she an handed us her Spanish Bible and said, every day I read Salmo 91. It's what got me through the last few months. Here, I want you to have this. He's part of ustedes. I wept at the gift of this precious possession. I wasn't familiar with that particular psalm, but when I read it, I teared up thinking of Miguel's great suffering. Yo le digo al Señor, tu eres mi refugio, mi fortaleza, el Dios en quien confío. I will say to the Lord, you are my refuge and my fortress, the God in whom I trust. No temerás el terror de la noche, ni la flecha que vuela del día, ni la peste que aceche en las sombras, 
ni la plaga que destruye a mediodía. You will not fear the terror of the night or the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes at noonday. Porque él ordenará que sus ángeles te cuiden en todos tus caminos. Con sus propias manos te levantarán para que no tropieces con piedra alguna. For he will command the angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Él me invocará, yo le responderé, estaré con él en momentos de angustia. Lo libraré y lo llenaré de honores. And when they call to me, I will answer them. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. <clears throat> Out of jail, at last, the terror of the night has passed. Keep Miguel, Lord, through the trials to come, like the apple of your eye. Shelter her under the shadow of your wings. My name is Mike San Giacomo, and I'm a, a reporter at the Plain Dealer at least for at least another week. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but we're having problems with the Plain Dealer. They've decided that uh, they no longer need a big third of the reporting staff, which I had no idea how they came to that conclusion. But anyway, uh, on Monday, April 1st, we will get a phone call telling us if we have a job or not. So. Anyway, um, I've been there a long time, so I, I'm, I'm ready to retire, and I've offered that, but they said that they would make the decision of who stays and who goes. So, um, one of the great things that has happened over my career, it, it's been a brilliant career. I, got, I loved it. I loved every, pretty much every minute of the plane dealer. Um, up until recently, it was a wonderful place to work. Um, I've been to Iraq. Uh, to Baghdad during the war, um, actually before the war, uh, at a point when um, we went with a group of American Indian medicine men, believe it or not, and uh, we went to Iraq against the advice of the State Department. And when I say advice, the exact quote from the State Department the spokesman that I talked to said, when you get when you get arrested and thrown in jail and held hostage, you will be the last person I try to get free. I said, thank you. <laughs> so um, I, I've been to Mexico twice. Uh, I'll tell you later about the, the first time I was there and went into Mexico City. This time, um, I'd been talking to Rita for a while about immigration issues, and we were talking about this uh, wonderful place that she works for, that she volunteers for in uh, Arizona. And I went into my editor and said, I'd like to go to, to uh, Mexico and, and work with uh, Rita and see what it's all about. And you know, I need at least a week and I need a photographer and I need a translator. And uh, to my shock, he said, sure. And I said, did you hear what I just said? I said, Mexico? you know, money, and um, maybe he knew what was coming and, and he figured that, that we wanted to do one last big fling. So we went there and uh, myself and, and the photographer, uh, Lisa Dijon, who was wonderful, she was my choice to go because Lisa's so, so good to work with. And we spent seven days there on the border and in Mexico. And, and Rita was like kind enough to basically help us out with everything. Otherwise, we would have been totally lost. Uh, I, I did bring some copies of the report that we finally ended up with. There's a few left if, if you haven't seen it. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what it was like when we were there, but when we came back and I started writing the story, I said to the editor, you know, this is gonna be a long story. And I said, I would really rather it be a series of stories. And uh, for reasons known to them, they wanted it as one giant piece. So it started off as a one-page story, one page in the paper. Then it went to two pages in the paper. And then it went to an eight-page special section, which is really cool, because it's the first one I've ever gotten to do. So what you see here is a result of um, a week down there, and then two weeks 
writing and rewriting and rewriting and rewriting. And anybody who's worked for a newspaper know what I'm knows what I'm talking about. So it's been um, a really interesting and, and eye-opening experience. Rita went over some of this already. This is the, the border wall at Nogales. And this is a closer up picture. This is the picture that Lisa hounded us for. We had to keep going back. I think we went back like seven times. <laughs> no, the sun isn't right. We're going, oh my God, we got things to do. But we finally, and, and I see what she meant. She wanted that picture. She wanted the picture of the sun streaming through the border. This was the uh, wall as it stood when we were there. And as you can see, they put up those spaces are approximately four inches. The grid work right there was only installed last year under the Trump administration, under their new rules. They put in the grid work and the, ra the uh, razor wire across the top. Previous to that, people could actually poke their heads through the four inch openings and they could meet, they could actually share meals. And it was civilized. I mean, it was, it was not nice, but it was the best they could do. It was people on either side of the border and they were allowed to, to communicate and they could pass food through, through those four inch openings. And then they decided in their wisdom that, no, that's not enough, we've got to put this up so that they can't you know, maybe pass drugs through. I don't know if that was their thinking, but I suspect it was. Um, the fact that there are Border Patrol people up and down there all the time would kind of discourage that anyway. So anyway, this is what we saw when we were there. We had this, and um, this is the Welcome to the United States, uh, the Department of Irony here. And then, the people had adjusted to the new lifestyle. Okay, they had the grail, the great. They could still talk, they could still see each other. They could get close, they could put their fingers through and they could communicate. And then two days after we left, if I can find the picture, which is not here, so there we go. This is what they did two days after the, the, we left which was amazing. I think, is this your Peter, uh, picture, Rita? Yeah, this is Rita's picture, because she was still there. And it was amazing. They put six layers of concertina wire across the entire border wall in Nogales, Arizona. And as you can see, there's nothing separating the wall from people. So you have someone walking along, and if they trip, and fall into that stuff, they'd be ripped to shreds and could very possibly bleed to death. I mean, this concertina wire is really, really horribly sharp. Um, I found the promotional video that the company that makes this wire put on, and they gleefully explain, they have a, a demonstration of a guy wearing these very big, thick gloves, and they gleefully explain, now watch as he tries to get in there and, and remove the wire, and as the guy is very carefully reaching in, the gloves were shredded in seconds. I mean, they were just shredded. And this guy's good. No one could ever get through this. So um, this is really cruel. I spoke to the mayor of Nogales, Arizona, who was furious about this. And I said, but mayor, surely you were told about this. He said, no. This was Sunday morning, which at this point was the day before. Sunday morning, they showed up and started installing this new wire. And they didn't tell the city and the, and the mayor went crazy and said, we have no way to train our people, our rescue workers, to help anyone who falls into that. There are homes that are literally 12 feet from that concertina wire. The backyard ends 12 feet before the concertina wire begins. He said there are gonna be children playing with their dogs, playing with each other. They're gonna trip and fall in. They're gonna be really hurt, possibly killed. Our, sir, our representatives who are in there trying to uh, rescue these kids, they're gonna be wounded. Why are you doing this? 
You can't get over this wall. I mean, you've got the concertina wire at the top. So, I mean, isn't that enough? Why do you need it all the way down? All that does is present, prevent people from the American side getting close. So, what we thought was horrible before when they had this great, I mean, now we look back at that and say, wow, weren't they the good old days? Because now you can't get within three feet of, of, the, of the, the, the wall. So, what else we have? This is the, um, we'll get back to that, and that, and that. I never can figure out how to put things in order. I apologize. <laughs> We, um, the wall itself is interesting, and uh, has anybody ever been to East Berlin before the wall fell? It was fascinating, it reminds me of this, because the American side is bland, there is nothing there. The only decorations on the American side are these occasional crosses, which designate the death of someone who tried to come across. That's it. You don't put graffiti on the American side. I, I, don't, I don't know why, I'm sure they would just stop you immediately. So um, it's very bland and, and there's nothing much to it. On the Mexican side, it, it's just a riot of, of color. <laughs> Boy, these really are out of order. It's a riot of color and uh, different things that show you the expressions of the people. This is the Mexican side. And this was a family that were being reunited with their uh, family members on the other side of the fence, and she's getting to see her granddaughter for the first time. Um, this is a young boy named, named uh, Jose Rodriguez, and he is a huge figure in Mexico. And we didn't even realize it at the time, but this was a very uh, a, a timely a moment in it for us to be there. This is on the Mexican side of the border, of course. This boy in 2012 was standing here and he threw a rock at a border patrol agent who was across the street and up a 25 foot embankment and behind the wall. And I stood where this boy threw the rock and I could not have, I mean, I'm not a great ball player, but I could not have thrown a rock that far. But th the sad part is, he, um, the Border Patrol agent shot him once in the head, and the boy, who was 16, went down. And then the Border Patrol agent shot him 10 more times in the back. The kid wasn't moving, I mean, he was dead and he shot him 10 times, so it was a total of 11 or 12 times that the boy was shot. Before we'd gotten there in November, this Border Patrol agent had his trial. It was, had been delayed. There had been another trial previously that, that I think it was a hung jury. And so he had just been found not guilty of anything. And the people were really upset about this because Th they couldn't understand, you know, how do you, how do you shoot someone 10 times in the back in another country and get away with it? And that's the thing that always, still to this day, I don't understand. If the person is coming over the wall and has a machine gun, sure. But this guy was causing no harm. He was down there. The, all the uh, Border Patrol had to, had to do to escape injury or, or danger was do that. If he were to walk back two feet, he was safe. I mean, the idea that a rock could somehow traverse 75 feet and go up and over or through is pretty ridiculous. But anyway, so that was one of the, the most fascinating things we, we came into. This is a uh, our friend and benefactor, Pancho, with Ashura Wallace, who's one of the founders, who's the founder of the Samaritan group that Reed is part of. And uh, this guy is an amazing story. And if you read the PD report, you, you've seen, he was deported from the United States and, and instead of getting him, the, getting him down, he started his own, he got an old play, uh, vehicle, turned it into an ambulance, 
and helps the poor people of Nogales, Mexico. And he's a heck of a guy. Um, we don't want to get into the border, but these are some giant dogs that we saw. <laughs> um, you'll see some of the same photos here, as you probably noticed. The interesting thing that, that I always say, the one thing I always say whenever I, I talk about this is, um, I sure don't have the answer to what's going on at the southern border. I don't, I don't know how to fix it, but I do know that it needs to be fixed. And I do know that we're not even attempting to fix it. It, it seems that what we're doing is just making it worse, letting it get worse and worse and worse. My fear is this, you've got a bottleneck now. You've got all along the border, you have tens of thousands of people who are fleeing murderous conditions in Central America. And they're coming up here and they're stopping at the border, begging for asylum out of desperation. They're only here because their lives are in danger. And our government rejects 81% of those people seeking asylum. And they've got these rules that really um, make no sense. Rules like um, if your life is being threatened by a, a gang, by a drug cartel, that's not a good reason, an acceptable reason, to be given asylum. If you're being if your life is being threatened for your political beliefs, that is. If your life is being threatened for religious beliefs, that's a, a way to, ex to request asylum. But yet, for some reason, if your life is being threatened by gangs or by your own family, uh, as was the case with some of the people we met, they're gonna turn you back. Part of the, the hardest thing that we went through there was talking to these folks who were waiting for that decision. They didn't know that 81% of them were gonna be rejected. Uh, there was a woman there who couldn't stop crying. She just couldn't stop crying, and she was from Mexico, Guaro, Mexico. And through her tears, she, and in Spanish, she explained to us that her husband, for some reason figured, dis, determined that one of their children was not his. And she said, I don't know why he thinks that all of a sudden, we've been together for eight years, but all of a sudden he thinks I've been cheating on him, so he beat her and almost, well, he didn't almost kill her, but he beat her badly. So she was so upset, she went to his parents with whom they were living. And, and she went to the father and said, you know, he beat me and he, uh, you know, I'm still, I'm still hurting and he said he was gonna kill me and he still won't believe me. To which the father then beat her. So she was then realized that this was never gonna change. So she gathered up her children and she, she left Guerra and made it all the way to Nogales and she just sat there and she was just crying and she was saying, this is my hope, this is my last hope, that I can get into the United States, I have a relative in Kentucky or someplace, and uh, I, I hope that, you know, they're gonna let me through and we'll start a new life. None of us had the heart to tell her that she didn't have a chance because it was a, a domestic situation and they just will not let you in. They used to, but they don't anymore. So we, we saw a lot of that, these people. This little girl, her parents were in, from, here are the parents, they were from Guatemala, not her. And they had a little grocery store. The husband witnessed a murder in, in Mexico and they tried to kill him, again, drugs, tried to kill him and he fled to Honduras, or Guatemala, I'm sorry, he fled to Guatemala to flee these people who were trying to murder him. And then in Guatemala, they were there for a couple of years and they had a family and they started this little grocery store. The um, local drug gang went to them and said, we demand 
$2,100, the equivalent of $2,100 a month from you, or we will kill you. And these people said, we don't even make $2,100 a month. We don't make that much. We, we couldn't do it. So they proceeded to beat them both, and they ended up in the hospital. And then when they got out of the hospital, we're told, well, we want our money. So this family had nothing to do but pack up their meager belongings and come forward. And if you can see, I don't know if you can notice it, but right there behind them, that's the border. So they are staying at a place called La Roca, which is literally on the border. So here they are, desperate, and because it was a gang, and they didn't know this, they're not going to get across. And yet the border is right there. It's just feet away. Um, it's just very sad that, that this is what they're facing. The, um, yeah, they stay there until they get, they get in and then to see if they can get across. So the sad part, as I said, is as this, uh, these people build in number, I don't know what the future is. I mean, it doesn't take a, a social scientist to, to, to start looking ahead here and say that if you've got this, this, this uh, people, these folks gathering at one place by the thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, and they're not being let through, but yet they think they're going to be let through, eventually the food is going to run out, the patience is going to run out. And that's when we're going to face some real trouble. That's when we will have a crisis at the border. Right now, we don't have the crisis. These poor people have the crisis. But that crisis could become ours if we don't do something about it. And the fact that this is happening, and when I say that the government is not doing much, they're not. The thing I heard over and over in the United States and in Mexico is that everything that's being done is being done by the religious organizations. I, I spoke to a priest in, uh, at El Comador in Nogales, Mexico, and I said, well, sure, you guys do this outreach and you, you have the uh, shelters. I said, but the government must be stepping in here. And it was the only time I saw this guy get angry. And he, and he said a few things that he shouldn't have said, which, or which amounted to, the government is doing nothing. And then he said, oh, please don't, don't say that because then they'll come after us. So, um, but the government is doing nothing. They're, they're allowing um, the Catholic organizations and the other religious organizations to, to handle this, this uh, humanitarian deluge of people, which doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, you would think that there'd be something that could be done. And if anybody has a suggestion, let me know. We also, um, while we were there, we went with this, this group uh, who were, were leaving water and clothing and food in the desert. Now, you saw how ominous the wall is. Well, that wall only extends seven miles from point A to point B in the Galas. If you were to walk that seven miles to the end, there's a wire fence that you can just step over and get into the Sonoma Desert on either end, which just kind of astounded me is because we, we keep building up this part here, this seven mile stretch, and yet a mile past that in, in both directions, there's nothing except the desert itself to keep you from crossing over. But once you cross over, then you've got to get through the desert, and that can be deadly. It can be deadly, especially in the summer when uh, temperatures can get up to 120 degrees, and the ground surface temperature is 150. So if you touch a rock, you get burned. Um, these folks leave water for uh, these people who, who are fleeing into the country and save countless lives, I'm sure. The, um, while we were there also, another group called uh, No Mas Muertes, No More Deaths, a pretty celebrated case, they were arrested for leaving water in a similar area. 
And the, the reasoning was uh, that they didn't have, they didn't request a permit to be in the desert, which no one does. And they were abandoning, what I think the abandonment of property. So the water was considered property that was abandoned. So they arrested these people. There was such a huge outcry that even though they found them guilty, they, they only fined them $200. But I think more importantly, what's happening here is that this is a message. And it's a message to these folks that Rita works with as well. I mean, that, that they're coming after you. They don't want you to, they don't want you to help these people. Um, this is us going into a, a part of the area where they had put up a fence to keep the cows out, those giant big ones, to keep the cows in, in line. And uh, this was kind of funny. The guy on the left is Peter Dean, and he's wearing these thing, these leggings. And I said, what are those, Pete? And he goes, those are rattlesnake leggings. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> And they said, do we have rattlesnakes? Oh yeah, they're all over the place. And he said, but they're mostly sleeping this time of year. I said, oh, okay, that's good. So that's the other thing. I don't know how many of you have ever wandered through the desert, but it's really difficult. I mean, you can't, you, you have to look where you walk because there's broken rocks everywhere. There are giant holes created by some animals. So you've got to be careful where you walk or you'll fall. But then if you're looking down, you're not looking at all the, the brush around you, which is designed to murder you. I mean, you have these giant uh, cactuses, and you have these smaller cactuses. There's even one called the jumping cactus, which, from what I understand, reacts to vibration. So if you're walking past it, it will drop these spiny balls, boom, boom, and they land on you. And one landed on me when I was with this cop, and, and he said, okay, stop. We gotta get that off before it gets into your skin because it'll hurt, you could get an infection. And I said, well, I'll just do you. No, 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 you can't touch it. And then he put on his gloves and he got this special tool and he, and he had to withdraw, remove it from my, from my pant leg. And he said, because if you don't remove it just the right way, it'll splinter into hundreds of pieces and they will all attack you. It's like they're alive. And I said, jeez, you people are crazy living here. And then, of course, you also have the scorpions and you have the uh, spiders and snakes. So making it through the desert is, is, is quite a chore. And that's why, uh, what was the estimate? I believe it was 120 a year are found dead in the desert by one county, Pima County, which is the biggest county but they find uh, between 100 and 120 dead bodies or skeletal remains in the desert every year. And these are the people who didn't make it. The sheriff told me that one of the guys they picked up was, was wearing a suit jacket, a tie, and a, and a shirt, and patent leather shoes. And he was in the middle of the desert and he was like, he went, ran up to the, to the police officers and said, Agua, Agua, help me, water, water. And they said, where were you? And he said he was, he was at a party and he just thought that it would be a good idea to try to come across. And when they, the, the coyote, the guy who took him across, dropped him off just across the border of Nogales in the desert, he said he pointed to him and said, now, um, Phoenix is that way about five miles. Phoenix was like 75 miles away. So this guy was wandering through the desert looking for Phoenix and um, obviously never came close. Um, I think we talked about this, or someone talked about this. These are the shoes that they wear. Uh, oftentimes a, drug, a sign of a drug dealer because they make shoes out of um, rugs which then don't leave footprints. You could just kind of drag them along and nobody can follow you. Uh, we found these in the, in the desert or with the cop. That was one of the women who was enjoying meeting with her family. There's the dogs again. This was the, what, what Rita referred to. This was a place that was built on top of a literal garbage dump. This um, husband and wife out of Phoenix, I believe, yeah, Phoenix, yeah, Phoenix, they, uh, 
the wife said that she heard about this, about these children who live in the dump and eat the food from the garbage. They just find something and eat. And she said that when she heard that, it was so horrible that she couldn't unhear it and she couldn't sleep. She said she could not sleep until she had to do something. And that was part of it was cut out from my story in The Plain Dealer. I thought that was really powerful. But she formed an organization, a charity, and went to the dump and built these shelters, these places where they serve food uh, for the children. And there are um, places where they can live, where the children, where the boys live, where the girls live, where the women live, and where the men live. And they serve hundreds. And they've been doing it ever since. So these kids actually have something to eat. I thought I had more than that. Any questions? Just yell them out. Is that, is that shelter in Mexico? Yes, yes. There are a bunch of them in Mexico. And this is the, the shelter where this little girl was hugging her little puppy. And this is, um, Rita showed you the one home where the kids live. Um, and literally, if you can just imagine that these people have no money, I mean, none at all. So they, they just build their houses over whatever they can scrounge from the, from the dump. So they'll just have, you know, two by fours and they'll just put up a, a, a I saw one, a wading pool. It was like part of the wall was a wading pool, plastic box like that one there, and that's what becomes their home. These are the folks from uh, Guatemala that I was telling you about who were extorted for $2,100 a month. These were kids, I think you've already seen this picture, waiting uh, for, to be determined if they can get amnesty. This is a, a wider shot of the village. This is in the suburbs of Nogales, Mexico. And on the way there, um, we stopped and Pancho said, wait a minute, I gotta run in here. And he ran in and he bought a bunch of bananas, like a whole bag of bananas. They gave them, gave them to him cheap. He said, what do you have for me? And they said, here, take these. And as Rita said, everybody was thrilled. It was like they'd never seen a banana before, but th they were just so excited to get it. Oh, sure, sure. There's political unrest down there, and when there's political unrest, you get gangs who are gonna take advantage of it. So the gangs were taking advantage of it and, and just basically murdering people, taking their money, uh, doing everything they can. So these people fled because the, the situation was not improving, it was getting worse, so they were fleeing for their lives, and still are. And I'm waiting for the next wave to come up from Venezuela because they're really having trouble down there. So we're gonna get the additional Venezuelans coming up unless they can go somewhere else. And this is the same shot, and again, you can see the wall right there. I think that's it. Oh, this is kind of, I wish you could see this photo better. Um, this was, again, this is where the, the boy was murdered. The boy was shot and killed. An artist, a Mexican, no, 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 it was an American artist, painted this at that spot. And you can't really see it, but what it is is, it's a little boy riding a donkey, and he's, he has a backpack on, and he's riding toward the United States. And the figure on the left of it is the figure of death. So the figure of death is waiting for the boy, kind of beckoning him on. But the little boy is facing back. He's looking back toward Mexico. And, the, and he, so he's like riding to his death, but not even realizing it because he's looking back home. And this is when I said that the boy had to throw the rock up. This is where he was. If you can imagine, this is a very wide street, and he's on this side. So he has to throw up 30 feet through a four inch gap, and he's 25, 30 feet back. So I don't know what kind of shot that would be or how dangerous that would be. 
Uh, our government said that the boy was distracting them from a drug deal that was being uh, committed through the, through the fence. That, that was the official ruling. Um, I think that's it. Well, my little shot of irony there that I always go back to. Notice that you can't really see it, but that's three different kinds of razor wire. Not just one, that's three. So if, if, the, if one variety doesn't get you, the other two will. As if you could ever climb over there anyway, because there's border patrol everywhere. Um, so what can we do? I don't know. <laughs> if anybody has a suggestion, great. The, the holding pattern that we're doing now is working, I suppose, as best as it's going to. Um, uh, letting charity workers do their best to, to help these people. But the government is ignoring the situation and ignoring what got us here. Um, one of the previous trips that I mentioned to Mexico was to uh, visit a man who was from Painesville who had been in an automobile accident and suffered brain injuries. He was barely out of the hospital when he was picked up by ICE, and within six days he was deported. And the, the uh, government sent him to Mexico, but they didn't just send him to Mexico. They sent him to a place called Nuevo Laredo, which, if you read government material, our own government, we say, for God's sake, don't go to Nuevo Laredo, it's the most dangerous city in Mexico. And it literally, at the time, it was that it had the highest murder rate in the entire country. So we send 60,000 people a year there. So I called ICE and I said, we have 11 ports of deportation, 11 cities across the border, and Mexico City, that's 12, where you could send people. Why do you send the most people to the most dangerous city in all of Mexico? And ICE said, no. They've yet to respond to that. And I've repeatedly, I'd say to them, why? Why are you sending people there? And they just will not respond. Well, this guy went over and they throw him off of the bridge and he, he gets processed by Mexican authorities. He walked off the bridge and literally within minutes, he was abducted. Him and another guy from Painesville. They were abducted, they were masked, they, they were thrown into a place and they were, they were fed garbage and threatened and beaten the whole time they were there. His wife, through her friends, was able to, to raise the money. They kept, they kept increasing the amount of, of ransom. They kept saying, send us $800, and she would send that. And then they would say, oh, she was able to send us that. We want 800 more or we'll kill her. And she just kept going until she finally, she said, I, I don't have any more money and none of my friends do it and that's it. And they just said to him, well, we're gonna kill you in the morning. And then the next morning, inexplicably, they put him in a bus, put him in a car, took him to the bus station and said, you're free to go. If you talk about this, we will kill your family and all your friends. And um, we did, he did talk about it to us. And um, a week later, I went, tracked him down in some little remote village where he was hiding out. And he was very nervous. And I said, Why, what's wrong? Why are you so nervous? And he said, my brother was gunned down on the street five days ago. So two days after he was released, his brother was murdered. Now he, he said, could be totally unrelated, I don't know, or it could be retribution. Um, but that was what happens in Mexico. Yes?
fantastic. Yeah, that just happened, that they started turning them back in mass. I mean, and these were people that they were saying, well, maybe we will give you amnesty, but you gotta wait over there instead of coming in to the United States and waiting, waiting as well. There are also, uh, uh, Rita was talking about the number of people in, in Tucson that the, the government is just saying, they're, they're calling churches and saying, we've got 100 people we're gonna drop off to you. And local churches are having to, to just put these people up in cots and everything else and, and try to take care of them. But at some point, there's not gonna be enough room. So, um, yeah, and it's just, they're not addressing the situation. They're just, it's just doing little things here and there to kind of keep it calm, but it's not working. Yeah, somebody else. Yes. Wow. Yeah. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way that the churches have to do it all. Jeez. It's yes. Not much. I mean, it, just think of the disease. Yes. Yeah, I don't remember seeing lines of porta potties anywhere. I mean, I don't know. I don't know where they're going. I mean, the Commodore has has one or two bathrooms that, that I'm sure are well used, and the churches must have some. But yeah, it's it's. Right. So they're, they're, just there. they're just there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sadly true. That's it. It's not a good scenario. So um, we had a, I had another story in today about a, a, a Cleveland Heights woman who's trying to get her husband back, who was deported um, ten years, nine years ago and she's been trying to get him back. Um, so uh, w we tried it for as long as I'm able. <laughs> I'll be doing some immigration stories and just trying to keep the fight up, but uh, it's difficult, especially when my editors are, they're influenced, even though they deny that they're influenced. They're influenced by the, the commenters, and if you've ever read the comments on the end of stories in the newspapers, they're horrible, they're really horrible and they're people who don't understand what they're talking about, and they're mean as snakes. I mean, they just, they just have this very selfish, very unchristian attitude, and I always love it when they start talking about Jesus and then go on to say, you should send them all back because they don't deserve to live. Um, <clears throat> uh, when, I, when I went to Mexico to talk to that guy, I also talked to a woman who was deported, and she said she was reluctant to talk to me, and I said, why? And she said, because, well, you use my name, and I can't bear to read the comments of what people will say about me. I said, you're living in the slums of Mexico City with no food and no job, and you're worried about comments by a bunch of jerks? And she was. So that, that's the thing that, that I've been begging my paid newspaper to do for, for years, just to uh, do something with those stupid commenters and, and, and uh, make it more difficult, make them say who they are, give me your name. That's when I have to respond, which I have to. You know, that's the first thing I say, you know my name. If you're gonna talk here, give me your name. Tell me where you live, let's be honest here. And I think that if they have to give their name, I think we're, most of them would not be so brutal. But, okay, so that's, uh, yes.
It's getting worse and worse. I mean, and you know, I look at, at, the, at the bastion of our industry, the New York Times, Washington Post, you can trust them. Despite what the, what the administration says, you can trust it if it's in the New York Times. I've worked with them in the past, and I, I, I did one story for them, and my God, it was fact-checked you know, 60,000 ways from Sunday. And I welcome that, because it made me realize that these guys know what they're doing. So, as I said, you can trust what's in the big major newspapers, and even our paper. I mean, we go crazy with fact-checking. Might make it boring, but we make it fact-checked and we know it's safe. But you get things like Alex Jones. Anybody familiar with Alex Jones? There's a monster? I mean, oh my God. But you get guys like him and Rush Limbaugh and Glenn Beck, and there are people who believe this drivel. They will believe Fox News. They will believe that that, that the media lies. And I don't know how to convince them otherwise, except we just keep on doing what we're doing and hoping that people finally figure out where the truth lies. But no easy answer there. Right, right, right. I mean, you know, when the commander in chief can say anything he wants, whether it's true or not, I mean, <laughs> how do you expect truth? How do you expect them to be rational, and, and they're not, so. Okay, anybody else, or I guess that's it? Okay, well thank you very much.